if you don't submit um, to control, if you're a, a radical, you're less likely to be loved. Um, you're not fitting in with society. Um, you're viewed as an outsider. Um, there, so there's a lot of um, uh, social prohibitions about the outsider and the, and the person who's gonna upset things. From the time we're very young, we're taught to you know, worship authority basically because that's our key to survival as young children. But as adults, we never go through the rites of passage that tell us how to methodically think for ourselves, and thus we're always in a state of extended adolescence. Well, we take all this stuff, whether it's the television or it's the enculturation, the, the schoolyards, the teachers, we take this whole system, we put it into our unconscious mind. And it is the G-I-G-O that comes out, garbage in, garbage out. We simply, in that computer language, have harnessed our own power by accepting all these beliefs as though they are factual. Whether it's the flat earth of uh, Columbus, or it's the idea that I'm not good enough to be or to do something I've dreamed to do. To the degree that the individual loses a sense of what freedom really means for himself, mind control is working. This is the constant battle and the struggle. What does my freedom mean to me? What is it? How deep does it go? How far reaching is it? Individuals come already with their rights. They're born with their rights. They're inherent. They're, they're hardwired. They're hardware. It's tragic. They've lost their sense of the importance of the individual. Each individual. We're not animals. We're individuals. We're created in the image of God. And so what you have is everybody's born into this control structure. Everybody's born into authority. Everyone's born into this situation. But just because you have an authority making decisions for you at some point when you're very young, too young to take care of yourself, doesn't mean you should always cater to authority your whole life. Fatalism, defeatism, what Bob Morley called mental slavery. That's was a huge thing that he would sing about. How do we emancipate ourselves from mental slavery? Have we moved to that point of such slavery that we're too far gone? and just kind of letting it all flow by and being apathetic about it just gets you in a position of being controlled. You know, there are some people that don't care. There are some people that don't know and don't want to know. It is very frightening. If you really look at it, you would only be, you would be left with the understanding that you were obligated to do something about it. And, you know, People work really hard every day, and they just want to relax and enjoy their life. We have established a framework for, for the most part, works pretty good. People enter into this contract with society. Uh, that contract allows them to, to follow certain rules and expect certain uh, returns on their investment of working within the framework of the, con the contract. Human beings form habits. At some point in our lives, many of us realize that the lives we are living are not those which we have imagined, but rather lives reflecting others' imaginations, as if we have been unwitting actors in someone else's script. Are we acting out the artificial roles created by others who have successfully harnessed our minds through our habits? To answer that question, one must first learn how the minds of individuals can be harnessed by systems of psychological control. Are the habits reflected by human beings in direct conflict with their needs to survive and thrive in this world? The enormous implications deter many of us from asking these simple questions and finding answers relevant to our daily lives. If we don't resist uh, all of the different information that comes our way and weigh it and, and use our own mind instead of what somebody else wants us to think, eventually uh, society will become nothing more than automatons, robots. The establishment has so, it's protected itself unless you submit to the saturation indoctrination and ab adopt all its values. You can't get in. Everyone needs to find out and really think about it what is going too far because all of this is happening so fast you need to be ahead of the game they're ahead of the game humans subjugate themselves to control because they're born into it and the tyrants and the social engineers know how to incrementally begin to slowly ratchet up 
the manipulation, the domination, uh, the oppression, so that people never really recognize it coming. It's the old analogy of the frog in the boiling pot. You throw a frog into a boiling pot, folks in Louisiana will tell you this, a bullfrog, he'll jump out. But if you put him in a cold pot, turn it on simmer, heat it up slow, he'll boil, and he'll never see it coming. Well, I think it has a lot to do with group collectivism, and like, go back to John Dewey, you know, he hated the individual. He hated the rugged individualism of Americans. They had to get rid of that. And so I think that when you've been reduced to uh, a member of the group, the collective, whether it's through sensitivity training that teachers have to go through or whether, you know, it's in your own community, like we have a community-oriented policing system, you know, where they give you a medal. If you do a good deed, well, you know, you're, you're part of the collective with the police. I would say in the next 50 years, if large numbers of people don't become consciously resistant to the overall mind control exerted on society, we're going to see many more people who really truly resemble androids. People induce this themselves by looking out at the world and saying, it's too dangerous for me to tell the truth or to say what I really believe or express how I really feel. It's much better if I fabricate a completely synthetic personality that's going to sit back here and remain passive. That's how it works. The idea of, of short-term gain, basically giving up freedoms. Freedoms, giving up freedoms is never a good idea. Since the dawn of time, small groups of human beings have instilled artificial circular limitations on the minds of their subjects through the procession of history. Traditionally, the limitations are imprinted on the servile population through a cunning use of language, instruction, and media for the purposes of conquest, social cohesion, and authoritative order by harnessing the human resources of the broad population. Human history reflects countless stories, regardless of what era you happen to live in, and the common thread throughout these stories is that of the struggle between the state, whatever its form, and the individual, the goal of which is to harness and subsume the individual, willingly or unwillingly, into its group collective. The role of authority is a predatory system that sees the individual basically as a unit of energy. The first forms of mind control go back to prehistory. And you would simply have a priest class that uh, developed technologies of herbs and medicine and had a value to the tribe. But pretty soon the priest class would start uh, studying the sky and when there were solar and lunar eclipses and would say, hey, uh, the sun's not going to come back on this date unless you make me king or unless you give me total control. And the people would say, okay, we saw the eclipse when you said it was coming. You know, the snake god ate the sun to the moon. What do you want? I want your firstborn child. Sacrifice him to me. Every culture does that. Every culture at one time or another demands human sacrifice because that's the state or the priest class demanding absolute, total, fealty and submission to it. Mind control has existed since the dawn of time. Only the methods have changed. Elites have always known, if I can control the minds of my people, I control them. Only the technology has changed. It's still the same program. It's never stopped. Sun Tzu, uh, within the, the, the works of the art of war, talk about the fact if you can understand your enemy so well to the level of where you can psych him out, basically defeat him before you put one boot on the battlefield, you, you've become a true master of your domain. The Greek author Plato embedded several key characteristics of ruling groups in his monumental work known as the Republic. Therein, he introduces the term cybernetics as a description of steering the ship of state Emphasizing crowd control, Plato memorialized the essence of the scenario used to control individuals to this day, to make them part of the group or state. This is famously known as the allegory of the cave, a useful strategy which is emblematic of the history of mind control. The idea of cybernetics first shows up in Plato's Republic, I believe it's book six, and in the Greek original text it's read kybernetes, 
but you can easily discern how this word tied into cybernetics, the control of not only nations, but how the making of individuals into the collective that forms the nations came about. As we've moved through history, every great leader has had to understand the, the potential of information, the potential of speech, the potential of words, the potential of books. What is a citizen, if not someone willingly or unwillingly participating in the machinations of the state? How would we acquire the habits of citizenship without stimulus from the state and our response to it? Attention! Attention! This is your beloved leader of the Exalted. There will be a special science joy rally today at Hawk Memorial Stadium. In an attempt to assist the state, a 14th century Italian named Niccolo Machiavelli crafted several books intended to help the ruling elite dominate their subjects with the most effective psychological warfare techniques available to the world at that time. And he was trying to convert the Medici family into hiring him to provide political advice. Conspiracy is the story of history. It's the story of plunderers taking care of people who produce. They claim to take care of them through government, which doesn't give you anything. It doesn't take away first. So it's not creating something out of nothing. It's very real what they're doing. They're taking your rights or taking some people's rights and adding more to someone else's rights. Concurrent to Machiavelli's efforts, the consequences of tyranny were sowing the seeds of liberty throughout Europe with authors like Etienne de la Boete of France leading individuals to consider their situations and discover effective means to achieving liberty for all. So this whole idea of Machiavelli telling the ruling elite how to do this in a more efficient and you know, uh, you know, effective manner without people directly knowing about it. But his mistake is that these books get out there and other people start to read these books because it's not just the ruling elite. Uh, this starts to have an influence in Europe. You've got a character named Etienne de la Boete who writes a discourse on voluntary servitude. And basically what de la Boete does is he shows you that everything that Machiavelli told the ruling elite about how to control you is undone when you understand it to the, you know, the, the nuts and bolts level where you can then withdraw your consent and that on, only then are you free. We control you. We control your mind. We make you believe you have no creative power. We make you forget you have imagination, which is the core capability from which you can invent your own reality. The myriad components of collectivism combine to form a comprehensive system for transforming the individual into a cog within the machinery of the state. The first step is to remove self-reliance, thus creating dependence on the state or collective. The next step is to create a motivation based on fear of scarcity as opposed to creativity and productivity. Remove the systems of autonomy, creativity and self-teaching which help create individuality in the first place and the void is filled by the will of the collective. Nature abhors a vacuum and the mind is no different. Innovative and enigmatic German philosopher of the 19th century Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel observed that human history could be manipulated to create a contrived outcome. Hegel's essential observations of the methods by which history may be authored by a small group translate into a world in which an individual's choices may be engineered away from his needs. How to engineer the opinion of the American people so that they would fully endorse, not only endorse, but demand war. Right oh, there's another one. Another plane just hit. <gasps> right? Oh, my gosh. Another plane has just hit. It hit another building. Flew right into the middle of it. Explosion. So it's problem. The people then beg for it. That's reaction. And then it's solution, which is centralizing more control. Create the problem. People scream. You couldn't impose any solution you want on people. 
One recent practical example of the use of Hegel's method for control is that of the infamous underwear bomber. I'm Kurt Haskell. I'm a Michigan attorney and I'm more well known as being the main eyewitness to the underwear bomber event on Christmas Day 2009. I saw two men approach the desk. One looked like a poor African man or maybe late, late teenager and one looked like a uh, wealthier Indian looking man who had on a tan suit. They were walking together and I just thought they were a weird pair and I was wondering why the two were together and I listened to their conversation as they went up to the desk and talked to the airline worker. When they went up there just the Indian man spoke and he said uh, this man needs to get on the flight but he doesn't have a passport and then the, uh, the airline worker said well he can't get on the flight without a passport and then the Indian man kind of argued with her saying well, he's from Sudan and we do this all the time. A student from Nigeria smuggled explosives onto a flight in his underwear. <laughs> Prosecutors staged a demonstration of what might have happened. But something went wrong. Abdul Mutalab's trousers burst into flames. Passengers and crew grabbed him. The plane landed safely. The source has confirmed that Farouk Matalab is the son of Alaji Matalab, one, a former chairman of one of Nigeria's biggest, wealthiest and most respected banks, First Bank of Nigeria. As soon as this happens, we see Mr. Chertoff all over the news and TV everywhere promoting these body scanning machines. But there are a few things we could do to make things better. First, we could deploy the scanning, the scanning machines that we currently are beginning to deploy in the U.S. that would give us the ability to see what someone has concealed underneath their clothing. To meet agendas in conflict with the needs of individuals, the ruling class creates an artificial crisis to which the public reacts by begging for the ruling class to intervene. The ruling class then enjoys the plunder made possible by removing the self-reliance from individuals. Good morning, everybody. Today's hearing is the third in a series of subcommittee hearings focused on some of the causes and consequences of the 2008 financial crisis, a man-made economic assault on our country that is still foreclosing on homes, shuttering businesses, and driving unemployment. The combined philosophies of Thomas Malthus, Charles Darwin, and Herbert Spencer led to the development of social Darwinism. Social Darwinism grafted the concept of the survival of the fittest onto the larger social framework. Claims of biological advantages or superiority could then be advanced as justification for future economic policy relating to the poor and as the basis of Francis Galton's pseudoscience of eugenics in the 20th century. So Darwin comes along about 150 years ago and comes out with his theories on where life comes from and then it's survival of the fittest and that the best organisms are able to survive in a competitive environment and uh, move forward in the evolutionary chain. And whether that theory is correct or partially correct or totally wrong is a side issue. The robber barons, the British royalty, uh, the J.P. Morgans of the world publicly adopted the idea of Darwinism and merged it with predatory eugenics. And the eugenicists who have always been looking for scientific causes to justify their sinning, if you will, that's what they found so useful in Darwin's work is they said, We've already had this belief system that we're better than you, but we now have science to back it up. Our entire current civilization, what we know as globalism, the new world order, is based on eugenics scientists that developed their theories in the last 200 years, mainly in England, Germany, and the United States. The entire science of genetics, biometrics, uh, eugenics, uh, computers, all of it, came out of the search for a system of total control over humanity. So the issue with eugenics is it claims to be a science of self-adaptation self for human species. So it sounds like a great thing if you're an individual. You want to make yourself better. If you reproduce, you want your kids to be strong and survive. However, the people who are doing it are taking and making a bunch of decisions for other people and violating volition and their free will all over the place because that's their modus operandi.
In his 1928 book, The Open Conspiracy, former British psychological warfare expert H.G. Wells wrote, the political world of the open conspiracy must weaken, efface, incorporate, and supersede existing governments. The character of the open conspiracy will then be plainly displayed. It will be a world religion. This large, loose, assimilatory mass of groups and societies will definitely and obviously attempt to swallow up the entire population of the world and become a new human community. The immediate task before all people, a planned world state, is appearing as a thousand points of light, but generations of propaganda and education may have to precede it. The government of England put massive funding towards the study of humans, and not just medicine, but human behavior. And so all the sciences that the British Empire used on countries that it was attacking and regions it was conquering were also turned inward against their own populations. In 1948, Eric Blair, the British journalist and author who assumed the nom de plume of George Orwell, wrote the iconic dystopian novel 1984. In it, Orwell outlined a collectivist future governed by technocrats in which a big brother totalitarian state maintains control of society through constant panopticon-inspired surveillance, fueled by a perpetual war and emboldened by both covert and overt forms of mind control and mass persuasion. The premise of the panopticon, it was an architectural design that was set up to maximize the power of surveillance. So if the prisoners didn't know, they could never tell if they were actually being watched at any one time, so they would have to assume that they were always being watched. Through 1984, Orwell introduced the concept of newspeak into popular culture, a debased language structure that would suppress the ability of the masses to upset the power of the state by regulating their thoughts through an illusory police force known as the Thought Police. Orwell's notion of doublespeak demonstrated the cognitive dissonance inherent in tyrannical structures. As the meanings of the words change, the meaning in society is lost. And fortunately, we have been able to raise our standard of living without sacrificing the spiritual side of life, which means so much to the American family. Thomas Henry Huxley, the man known as Darwin's Bulldog, produced a number of grandchildren, the two best known and most influential being Julian and Aldous Huxley. Sir Julian Huxley, an evolutionary biologist, was elected as the first director general of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, and also served as both vice president and president of the British Eugenics Society. So the Huxley family is highly interesting because T.H. Huxley is the teacher over H.G. Wells who becomes a famous protege. But Huxley's whole family is not only intermarried and working on these eugenics ideas themselves, but they have, uh, you know, he has a, a famous son and grandson and, and all sorts of famous cousins that tie into the Darwin Wedgwood family. So notably, you have Aldous Huxley who coins the phrase Brave New World in 1932 with his novel, which is really describing a technocratic future by which people are pharmaceutically drugged into loving their servitude. I think what, what is going to happen in the future is the dictators will find, as the old saying goes, that you can do everything with bayonets except sit on them. That if you want to preserve your power indefinitely, you have to get the consent of the ruled. And this they will do, partly by drugs, as I foresaw in, uh, in Brave New World, partly by these uh, new techniques of, uh, uh, of propaganda. Uh, they will do it by bypassing the sort of rational side of man, and appealing to his uh, subconscious and his uh, deeper emotions uh, and uh, his physiology even and so making him actually love his slavery I mean I think this is the danger that actually people may be in some ways happy under the new uh, regime but they will be happy in situation where they oughtn't to be happy leveraging the fact that the 20th century opened up numerous avenues for shaping and controlling 
the thoughts and behaviors of the population. The ruling elite contrived new ways of obscuring useful facts while peddling useless ideas to the American people. Advertising, in addition to fundamental changes in education, produced a population of non-thinkers whose false understanding of basic concepts instilled through public schooling led to generations of people who feel they are magically endowed with the ability to somehow attain knowledge without first observing the landscape of available, credible evidence. One such artifact of credible evidence which demonstrates that our lives are being scripted by the ruling class is a 1966 textbook authored by Georgetown professor Dr. Carol Quigley titled Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time. In it, Quigley details a secret society partially funded by central banker Lord Rothschild, enacted by Cecil Rhodes and led by Lord Alfred Milner and the Round Table Journal of International Affairs, which Quigley terms the Milner Group. The first questions most people ask upon hearing of such a book are, why is it so important? And why do so few know about its existence? This is a key book. It's almost like the Rosetta Stone to decode everything they're doing. It's over a thousand pages long with incredible you know, documentation in the bibliography of how this ruling elite based out of Britain is using a full spectrum dominance model to fund the communists, to fund the fascists, to fund the Democrats, to fund the Republicans, so that there looks like there's a choice, but everything really is moving towards collectivism for the general public, while the elite themselves are exempt from all their own rule. Once the power structure got all the best and brightest students of the world and put them through Rhodes Scholar type programs, not just in England, but in other nations, they could then control the brain trust and have a fully programmed new generation to take control of the governmental, corporate, and media systems to carry out the program. Their goal was to dominate all of those major power centers quietly behind the scenes. And by moving the leadership in a certain direction, then they knew that they could control the masses without the masses even knowing that they're being dominated and led by a very small, powerful elite group. Although education has proven to be highly effective in controlling human behavior, more intensive research would need to be conducted away from the prying eyes of the public. The Tavistock Institute was set up by the British Empire to really study mind control and to scientifically drill down into human behavior and put in textbook form systems of basic control so that could be duplicated out to government and corporate entities. And Tavistock has been involved at every level of social engineering. The Tavistock Clinic was founded in 1920 and operated as part of the Psychological Warfare Division of the British military. It was initially a voluntary outpatient clinic for treatment and research and was made up of general physicians, neurologists, and psychiatrists to facilitate the treatment of neurosis and shell-shocked British soldiers returning home from World War I. Going through their own publications on Amazon, you can find some of their books cost like eighteen, twenty thousand dollars And that what that tells me is they don't want the average person to be anywhere near getting their hands on this book because what it gives you inside those books is the teacher's edition to use an abstraction as opposed to the, you know, the students sitting around the class not knowing what the answers to the questions are. There's a group of people who are being given the answers to all the questions about how we act, react, and how we've been understimulated with curiosity in, more, in, in order to make us more subordinative. You could say much of our world today uh, is the world of the Tavistock Institute and Edward Bernays. Having been instrumental in the Tavistock Clinic and director of the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations, it was former officer and consulting psychiatrist to the British Army, John Rawlings Reese, who created the concept of the psychological shock troops or culture warriors a federation of psychiatrists which he intended to disperse across the globe to make it quote 
possible for people of every social group to have treatment when they need it, even when they do not wish it, without it being necessary to invoke law. The Tavistock Institute's influence did not stop simply at social psychology. Kurt Lewin, former head of Britain's Psychological Warfare Bureau, was a German refugee who became the founder of modern social psychology in the 20th century. An early consultant to the OSS and an influential researcher with the Tavistock Institute in the area of management thinking and action research, specifically focused on the tactics of managing change within society. No organization of the size and scope of Tavistock can operate for long without ample funding. From whom is that funding derived? Certainly no small part comes from the seemingly benign tax-exempt foundations of the global elite. I was researching the Reese Committee uh, back in like 1952, 1953, where they went in and investigated major foundations and some of their subversive activities. These foundations put an enormous amount of energy into controlling what is being taught at the schools uh, and how it's being taught and preparing, using schools basically to indoctrinate children to accept their station in life, to accept a, a collectivist future. According to Dr. Lily Kay, whose expertise was demonstrated in her 1993 book, the Molecular Vision of Life, the Rockefeller Foundation, Caltech, and the New Molecular Biology. The world in which we are living has been molded, shaped, and continues to be directed by an elite establishment of eugenicists, a ruling class fueled by violating the will of others to attain their goals. Nowadays, almost every adult agrees on one basic goal for all students. Schools ought to turn out good citizens. Yes, good citizens. That's right. Absolutely, this country always needs good citizens. The real goal was to change America from an individualist system into a collectivist system, and in which case it could be merged with the rest of the world and there would be this great new world order that we hear so much about in recent years. The purpose of creating tax-exempt foundations was not just to collect more money, but to invisibly assert influence over the power centers which control the programming of individuals, specifically to breed the self-reliance out of individuals and prepare them for the collectivist lifestyle planned by the ruling class. Their goal to undermine personal liberty on biological, social, and economic levels. They came together and decided what they were going to do with this money was to gain control of education in America, not for a philanthropic purpose, but to change the thinking of the American people over a generation or two. The globalist social engineers hungered and desired and coveted the power that the liberty in the U.S. had created. They wanted to take it over, and the tax-free foundations wanted to use it as an engine of global domination, and they've done that. And the Reese committees were the only time when Congress stood up constitutionally and demanded all the big foundations come and testify and open their private books. And the Rockefeller, the Carnegie, the Ford Foundation, they all came and said, look, we're here under presidential uh, directive from more than 50 years ago. We've been told to collectivize the United States to merge it with the Soviet Union. We've been told to make America more compatible uh, with authoritarian regimes, and we're just doing what we were chartered to do. Until the creation of language, brute force held the key to fear, and thus to the control of individuals through violence and physical aggression. With the innovation of language, the minds of individuals could be harnessed with ideas and beliefs, making less significant the physical dominance of previous generations. This is how, for example, men of small stature could keep otherwise brave and ferocious gladiators as household slaves whose deaths could be used for profit and entertainment.
Out of the ashes of World War II rose the specter of human experimentation in the form of the 1939 to 1945 exodus of Nazi intelligentsia to continue their research and experimentation under the protection of national security. After being denazified, they were given new identities to live among those against whom they had fought. We brought uh, Werner von Braun over here and several other uh, scientists, including those that were involved in concentration camp medical experiments, including mind control experiments. A lot of these guys were, as far as the State Department was concerned, war criminals. They were linked directly to the Nazis and therefore couldn't get visas, couldn't come into the United States. So the CIA set up this series of programs uh, to route everybody around the State Department visa requirements, get them into the country. Everybody knows about the race at the end of World War II to get Nazi scientists. The Russians wanted them, the United States and England wanted them. And the United States and England got most of them because the Nazis didn't want to go to the Soviet Union, another authoritarian system. They wanted to go to a, quote, freer system. And like an infection, they came to England, Canada, and the United States. And it wasn't just over NASA and rocketry with Werner von Braun and Goddard and others. It was tens of thousands in mind control and torture and military science and surveillance. And the CIA got modeled to a great extent off of the Gestapo. And so we see really the evil of the Nazis being transplanted back to the United States and England where the eugenics philosophy that they had embraced had originally sprung. The Office of Strategic Services, the precursor of the CIA, under the direction of William Wild Bill Donovan and Alan Dulles, recruited Nazi scientists and aided their importation into America. Among them were rocket scientist Werner von Braun and the aeronautical physician Hubertus Strughold. The problem that the United States was facing was there was all these German scientists who were kind of in the wind, loose, wasn't clear where they were going to end up. And the uh, French, the British, the Russians, and the Americans were all trying to recruit them. The Germans had developed lots of different advanced weapons. And they'd also uh, done a lot of experimentation on human beings in the, in the uh, concentration camps. Uh, so they had a lot of medical data that we didn't have. We, they had, uh, of course, the rocket scientists and the airplane scientists and all the rest of it. And Paperclip was our version of going into Europe and finding these guys and bringing them to the United States to work. What we're missing in the documentation, we have uh, physicians, aerospace medicine people, film people, ball bearings, projectile experts, all kinds of scientists. We're missing from the story of the psychiatrists. But there must have been psychiatrists brought over, you know, in parallel to Strukold under paperclip. German financing came from America, came from Wall Street, and came from American corporations. Even the political support that Hitler got in Germany was, to some extent, traceable to American influences. Prior to World War II, American financiers banks, corporations, all decided that there was money to be made in pre-war Germany. After all, they all knew that Germany was preparing to become a military aggressor and it needed money to construct vehicles of war. They were spending a lot of money designing and building tanks and airplanes and military carriers and things like that, submarines, ships, and uh, there was money to be made. And so Wall Street and some of the largest corporations like AT&T and even Ford Motor Company got very much involved with the um, Nazi regime. The experiment that went on became known as Nazi Germany starts in World War I and the Versailles Treaty in Paris 1919, basically giving the Germans the short end of the stick, uh, giving them war reparations that they can't possibly pay, totally unrealistic. Now, this famous German banker named Helmar Schacht gets together with a guy from the Bank of England named Montague Norman, and they create something in 1932 called the Bank for International Settlements. And they use this as a clearinghouse for all the national debts, but really it's being used to launder money. What you find then is that same group, Helmar Schacht, becomes Hitler's banker. 
So Hitler is totally financed by these people who are making their lives out of pulling the wool over other people's eyes. And at the same time, they want to have the National Socialist Experiment to test out the Prussian education system that they are using and about to roll out all over the world. Following the 1945 completion of Operation Paperclip, the CIA created MKUltra, a top secret mind control research project, which was managed by Sidney Gottlieb under the direction of Alan Dulles. The program began in the early 1950s, was officially sanctioned in 1953, and officially terminated in 1973. The program engaged in many illegal, unethical, and immoral activities. In particular, it used unwitting US and Canadian citizens as its test subjects which led to controversy regarding its legitimacy. MKUltra involved the pioneering of many methodologies to manipulate individuals' mental states and alter brain functions, including the surreptitious administration of psychoactive drugs and other chemicals, hypnosis, sensory deprivation, isolation, verbal and sexual abuse, and other various forms of torture. When I interviewed John Marks about Search for the Manchurian Candidate, he said a very interesting thing to me. He had been given 10 boxes of CIA information on a Freedom of Information Act request, not his first. He had been trying to get this kind of information on the mind control program of the CIA in the 50s, 1950s, for a long time. And finally, as a kind of a sop, maybe even a joke. They gave him 10 boxes of materials that had nothing to do with the projects except the accounting data, the financial data, thinking that Marx wouldn't be able to do anything with it and they would, CIA would be perceived to have fulfilled the FOIA request. But Marx was too smart for them. He saw into the financial data and realized what he had his hands on. In 1994, President Clinton created the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments, which was tasked with investigating the instances of federally funded research using ionizing radiation on human beings. Based on the documents made available to the committee, they identified nearly 4,000 cases of human radiation experiments taking place between 1944 and 1974. This included a series of federally funded experiments in which unsuspecting hospital patients were injected with plutonium. Many details of MKUltra experimentation were disclosed during a public hearing before the advisory committee. I'm going to start. My name is Valerie Wolf. In listening to the testimony today, it all sounds really familiar. I am here to talk about a possible link between radiation and mind control experimentation that began in the late 1940s. The main reason that mind control research is being mentioned is because people are alleging that they were exposed as children to mind control, radiation, drugs, and chemical experimentation, which were administered by the same doctors who are known to have been involved in conducting both radiation and mind control research. Written documentation has been provided revealing the names of people and the names of research projects in statements from people across the country. It is also important to understand that mind control techniques and follow-ups into adulthood may have been used to intimidate these particular research subjects into not talking about their victimization in government research. People talk about MK Ultra in two senses. It's kind of like an umbrella term for all mind control programs. But technically, it's just a specific program that ran from the 50s into the 60s. And it stopped in 64. Therefore, MKUltra could not be operational today. But something like MKUltra with a different name surely must be. And I don't think there's any doubt in my mind at all that clearly mind control methods are used at Guantanamo Bay. I mean, there's all the hallmarks of mind control. There's hooding. There's forced sitting positions, there's sensory deprivation, sleep deprivation, all kinds of um, you know, attacking the person's belief system, 
sexualizing the interrogation, subjecting them to things that go against their religious faith, probably hallucinogens and drugs, can't document that, and waterboarding. So all the components of a mind control program are in place there. The hearings weren't really about that, and the women didn't have solid, solid, solid documentation, but they told the kind of stories that I hear over and over from mind control victims. So Claudia Mullen and Christine Nicola get up on the stand in Washington and they say, yes, radiation, but it was only one part of mind control experiments that we were subjected to by the U.S. government starting out when we were children. And then somebody on the committee said, uh, from what I've been told by witnesses, pretty much, thank you very much, and now we move on to the next witness. <laughs> right. Like, let's pretend none of this took place. In the 19th century, Franz Mesmer's brand of hypnotism entertained countless audiences, which consequently evolved, both covertly and overtly, throughout the 20th century. CIA's Dr. George Estabrooks, a graduate of Harvard University and a Rhodes Scholar, finally created methods of reliable hypnotism enabling its application to the science of social control. George Esterbrooks was a Canadian-born psychologist whose career was at Colgate University in upstate New York. Um, as early as 1943 in his textbook Hypnotism, he described in great, great detail, uh, going back to the Second World War, taking um, Marines or other military people, using hypnosis and other programming on them to create a new personality. So he calls that Jones A and Jones B and the new program personality would be given an assignment which could be a courier penetration any kind of assignment and the out front regular person would have total amnesia complete lack of knowledge of the assignment estabrooks was a leading authority on hypnosis programming soldiers during world war ii to act as couriers who were not aware they were hypnotized operatives on a mission in this manner, the OSS targeted political objectives through the covert methods of assassination and espionage, leveraging the science of hypnotism. Where hands-off hypnotic and pharmacological methods fail, the physical application of actual electrical stimulus directly to the brain becomes the next logical step. In 1964, Yale neuroscientist Jose Delgado implanted radio-controlled electrodes into the brain of an aggressive bull in an attempt to control its behavior in a ring with a matador. With the push of a button, Delgado himself was able to stop the bull in mid-charge. He didn't stop with the bull, but also conducted experiments on cats, monkeys, and even human test subjects. He had people as young as 11 he was doing this to. One was a 16-year-old girl, and there's pictures in his books where she's kind of staring off into space, vacant. Another, she's strumming on a guitar. Another, she's pounding on the wall, all based on what button he's pushing on the transmitter box. Delgado developed what he called a stimosiever that allowed him to target specific emotions and regulate behavior by aiming radio stimulation at different regions of the brain. His idea of the future is and this he was totally serious about and described in detail. We're going to put electrodes in the entire population, except probably Dr. Delgado, Delgado himself, and a few elite generals, and we're going to control the entire population. And this is not going to be fascism. This is going to be the next step in evolution. Dr. Donald Ewan Cameron was a Scottish-born psychiatrist who was president of the American Psychiatric Association from 1952 to 53 and later first president of the World Psychiatric Association. Cameron was directly involved in the brainwashing attempts of Central Intelligence Agency's top secret MKUltra mind control program. Under directives from Sidney Gottlieb and funding from the CIA funneled through various front organizations, he spent years researching and experimenting with behavioral modification techniques. It was here that the CIA funded a series of experiments, severe experiments. The work was done by the Institute's then director, Dr. Ewan Cameron. It is the closest experimentation to brainwashing yet disclosed. 
His work, unprecedented in psychiatry, consisted of three areas which he called sleep therapy, psychic driving, and the ultimate depatterning. Dr. Maurice Dangier, current head of the Allen Memorial Institute. In his uh, psychic driving, uh, so-called uh, type of, of therapy, he would give the patient intensive uh, electric treatment in order to make the patient uh, regress deeply, uh, become forgetful, and then he would uh, attempt to implant new ideas uh, in uh, the mind of the patient. Now, to a layman, it would appear that Dr. Cameron was trying to take the slate and wipe it clean, the slate being the mind. In other words, brainwashing. Exactly, that's a very good comparison. Brainwashing. Yes, you like. Dr. Ewan Cameron was a MK Ultra contractor. Officially, it says that he didn't have top secret clearance, but I'm sure that in fact he did. The reason I say that is he was at different times president of the Quebec Psychiatric Association, the Canadian Psychiatric Association, the Society of Biological Psychiatry, and the World Psychiatric Association. Ewan Cameron was the most famous psychiatrist in the world during the 1950s. You name a psychiatric association of any size or scope, he was the president of it. He became a, a, a psychiatrist. Uh, he, in fact, at one time he was the president of the World Psychiatric Foundation, uh, and he ended up immigrating over here from Scotland and uh, was, was working in Canada under Sid Gottlieb, and he headed up one of the projects dealing with LSD and with, mind, with different types of mind control projects that he had, especially hypnosis. His experiments were basically, uh, there's kind of two components to it. One is psychic driving, and the other is depatterning. So depatterning is you give massive amounts of electric shock to the person, like 100 plus treatments, with six times the usual amount of electricity per treatment. Completely wipe their minds out, so they, they don't know who they are, where they are, they don't recognize their children. And then once they're in that state, you uh, can add on barbiturates and other drugs, keep them asleep for weeks at a time, or kind of like half asleep, and then play tape loops over and over and over and over. That's the psychic driving. And the tape loops will be in the doctor's voice or the person's voice. And this is all supposed to program a new personality. It has been alleged in some cases that Cameron held patients against their will for weeks at a time, drugged and unconscious under the threat of being committed to an institution for life if they did not participate in his treatments. He began a program of torture, and I don't use the word lightly, on patients who had no idea this is why they were coming to him. They were people who came to him for therapy, for help, and he experimented on them as a torturer would to create new personalities. Cameron operated with Rockefeller funding at the Allen Memorial Institute in Montreal, Quebec, where he contended that it was first necessary to depattern the minds of his patients in order for them to have a shot at recovery. He also participated in the Nuremberg trials of 1945, interviewing many of the top Nazi defendants. After World War II and the creation of the CIA, the need for um, a truth drug and drugs that could perform, that the CIA could use for other purposes, increased. They turned to the Bureau of Narcotics and Harry Anslinger. And again, Anslinger anteed up Agent George White to be his uh, lead agent in this program called MKUltra. It started basically in 1952 in New York City. White was working with um, a CIA officer named Sidney Gottlieb. Gottlieb was chief of the technical services division at the time, and he had um, access to a lot of LSD. CIA scientists had decided was um, the drug that they were going to focus on now. Pot wasn't considered quite potent enough to do the things that they wanted to do. White conscripted a couple of um, federal narcotic agents to help him, a couple of informants, uh, narcotic agent informants to help him and um, went into the streets of New York and got a softcore pornographer named Gil White to help him as well. Apparently, White had his own sexual perversions um, 
which have been written about. He was into S&M, so he had a couple of qualifications for the job, which went beyond just being a, um, a federal agent who could perform these functions. He actually was good at acting out the sorts of things that went on in the drug underworld. In 1953, the, the program was formalized and it was called Midnight Climax. And um, he had, White had a safe house in New York City with which the CIA outfitted with um, a two-way mirror with uh, microphones and, um, and uh, recording devices so that um, White and, his, uh, and the CIA scientists could actually film people who had been surreptitiously dosed with LSD. The program expanded beyond merely LSD and what they found out was that the safe houses themselves were probably the most valuable aspect of this program. Prostitutes that were in their employ that would bring people to these um, uh, apartments and they could actually record them while they were doing drugs. In 1960, the CIA opened another safe house in New York City. And I talked to the people who um, were running this safe house. And one of the narcotic agents said to me that they felt that um, the CIA was actually using this safe house when dignitaries were visiting the UN or politicians were coming to New York City to talk to the mayor or uh, state or even federal officials that they were using the uh, filming them and using uh, potentially using their the films for um, purposes of political blackmail.